Hey you guys, this is Mr. Millings and today we're going to talk about intramolecular forces. So what are intramolecular forces and how do they work? Well, let's suppose we have a water molecule. Okay, that is two hydrogens bonded to one oxygen. So we have a water molecule here. All right. And what we want to do is we want to take a look at the chemical bonds here that hold the hydrogen to the oxygen together in a water molecule. Well, if we take a look at these chemical bonds here, which we will be able to determine at the end of this video that they're polar covalent bonds, then we will be talking about intramolecular forces. All right, intramolecular forces, as it says right here, are forces that hold the atoms together in a compound or molecule. All right, so we'd be looking at the chemical bond that holds the hydrogen and oxygen together right here and right here. We'd later determine that it to be a polar covalent molecule. Uh, and these polar covalent bonds uh, are a type of intramolecular force. Now, in a later video, what we'll learn is this. Let's suppose I have another water molecule, which would look something like this right here. Okay. We know that a water molecule is polar, meaning that one end of the water molecule is slightly more positive and the other side is slightly more negative. So if we get a bunch of water molecules together, there's going to be a force of attraction between the water molecules. If we talk about this force of attraction, if we talk about this hydrogen bonding right here, then we'd be talking about intermolecular forces. Okay, so intramolecular forces are forces uh, that hold the atoms together in a compound or a molecule. And intermolecular forces are the forces that exist between compounds or molecules. So that is an important uh, concept to understand. And in this little video here, we're going to talk about intramolecular forces. So what are some intramolecular forces we're going to talk about this video? Well, we're going to talk about ionic bonds, which are bonds that are formed when electrons are transferred between two atoms in a compound. We're also going to talk about nonpolar covalent bonds, which are bonds that are formed when electrons are shared equally between two atoms in a compound or molecule. And lastly, we're going to talk about polar covalent bonds, which are bonds that are formed when electrons are shared unequally between two atoms in a compound or molecule. All right, one final intramolecular force is called metallic bonds or metallic bonding, which are bonds that are formed between atoms in a pure metal or an alloy metal or metal alloy. We're not going to talk about those in this video, though. We're going to stick to ionic bonds, we're going to stick to nonpolar covalent bonds, and we're going to stick to polar covalent bonds. And hopefully by the end of this video, you should be able to look at a, a, chem, a compound or a molecule and determine what type of chemical bonds exist between them. So let's take a look now at the duet rule and the octet rule. All right, let's take a look at the duet rule and octet rules, which basically are the main driving force or the reason why virtually 99.9% .9 of all chemical reactions take place. Okay, because of the duet rule and the octet rule. And what the duet rule and octet rule refer to are the amount of valence electrons or the electrons in the outermost energy level that atoms prefer to have. For example, atoms like hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium, and boron, all of these guys typically want two valence electrons in their outermost energy level or outer shell. Okay, that is known as the duet rule. Okay, if they do this, they will achieve a noble gas electron configuration. You can think of the noble gases as the cool kids on the block, and all other atoms want to look like a noble gas. All the noble gases have either two valence electrons or eight valence electrons, and every other atom on the periodic table wants either two or eight valence electrons. And hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron all want two, and all the other atoms on the periodic table they want eight valence electrons, okay? So the duet rule refers to the fact that some atoms want two valence electrons, and the octet rule refers to the fact that most atoms on the periodic table want eight valence electrons or eight electrons in their outer shell or energy level, okay? So it's an important concept to understand that it's the transfer of electrons or the sharing of electrons between atoms trying to achieve their duet rule or octet rule uh, that drive virtually 99.9 percent .9 of all chemical reactions except for nuclear reactions. They're all trying to get either two or eight valence electrons so that way they can look like a noble gas because the noble gases are like the cool kids on the block and everybody's trying to be like them. Alright, so let's take a look at a periodic table now 
and to try to determine or take a look at the different groups in the periodic table and, and, and determine how many valence electrons there are in each group. Let's take a look at a periodic table now. All right, so here's our periodic table. And some periodic tables will actually show you the electronegativity value for each element. For example, if we take, in the, take a look in the bottom right-hand corner of each box, we'll see these little numbers here. Those little numbers refer to the electronegativity value of that element. For example, the most electronegative element on the periodic table is fluorine. It has an electronegativity of 4.0. If we take a look at the least electronegative, that's going to be francium and cesium, which have an electronegativity of 0.7. But what does that mean? Well, electronegativity is the ability an atom has to attract electrons toward itself. In other words, fluorine has a very good ability at attracting electrons toward itself. All right, Electrons flock to a fluorine atom, whereas francium and cesium don't have a good ability at att attracting electrons toward itself. All right, and this will come into play later when we determine whether or not a, a chemical bond is either polar or ionic or, uh, or nonpolar covalent in nature. But if we take a look at this periodic table also, what we can do is determine the number of valence electrons the atoms have or some of the representative atoms have on the periodic table. For example, in group one here, all of these guys have one valence electron one valence electron in their outermost energy level. All right, all these guys here have two valence electrons. In group two, these guys all have two valence electrons in their outer shell. In group one, all these guys have one valence electron in their outer shell. If we take a look at here in group 17, these guys all have seven valence electrons. Next door, these guys all have six valence electrons. And these guys typically have five valence electrons. All right, so those are important concepts to understand. If you take a look at the noble gases, these guys, this helium here has two valence electrons and all the others have eight. And you might notice that most of these noble gases don't have an electron negativity. They don't want to attract electrons toward themselves because they already have two or eight valence electrons, right? They're stable. That's why they don't react typically. Now you'll see a, an electron negativity for krypton and for xenon and radon, but typically, these are the noble gases. They don't react, and they don't react because they have, uh, they've satisfied their duet and they satisf they've satisfied their octet. All right, but there are some, there are some exceptions to that. All right, so let's take a look now at ionic bonds versus nonpolar covalent bonds versus uh, polar covalent bonds, and apply the concepts of the duet rule, the octet rule, and the idea of electronegativity. All right, so the very first intramolecular force we're going to talk about are ionic bonds. So what are ionic bonds? Where they're bonds that form between atoms when electrons are transferred between the two atoms in a compound. All right, and these are typically found between metals and nonmetals, and that's an important concept to understand, that whenever you have a chemical bond between a metal and a nonmetal, it will always be an ionic bond, okay? That's a very important concept to understand. So let's take a look here. We have a sodium atom here, right? It has a total of 11 electrons, and it's got this one little valence electron right here. That's the electrons in the outermost energy level. So it has one valence electron. It wants eight. Remember that? It wants to satisfy its octet. All right, here's a chlorine atom. If we take a look at chlorine, it's got seven valence electrons, two, four, six, seven valence electrons. It, too, wants to have eight. So here's what happens whenever a sodium atom gets next to a chlorine atom. What ends up happening is that the sodium atom donates or transfers an electron to this chlorine here. In doing so, if we take a look over here, this chlorine now is going to have eight valence electrons, two, four, six, eight, as it becomes the chloride ion with a negative one charge or a one minus charge. All right. If we take a look at what happens to the sodium atom when it loses this electron or transfers it to the chlorine, uh, what ends up happening is this outer energy level is going to disappear and expose this energy level right here. So if we take a look now, this sodium ion is going to have two, four, six valence electrons, right? Uh, two, four, six, eight valence electrons, and it satisfied its octet rule. So both of these guys now have eight valence electrons. This guy's got two, four, six, eight, and this sodium's got two, four, six, eight, and the result between these two ions here is going to be an ionic bond, a force of attraction that holds these two guys together, that holds the sodium ion and chlorine ion together in this compound will be an ionic bond because of this one little electron being transferred to the chlorine atom.
All right, so ionic bonds are formed when one or more valence electrons is transferred between uh, two atoms in a compound. And it's pretty simple to spot an ionic bond. Whenever you have a metal and a nonmetal bonded to each other, for example, right here, sodium is a metal, chlorine is a nonmetal. All right, and the chemical bond that, that, that holds these two guys together is going to be an ionic bond. All right, so that's uh, one type of intramolecular force. Let's take a look at another one. All right, and nonpolar covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are bonds that are formed between atoms or two atoms when electrons are shared between those atoms. Okay, so covalent bonds exist when electrons are being shared between atoms, and in a nonpolar covalent bond, what you have are electrons that are being shared equally between those atoms because of the electronegativity values of those atoms are very close to one another. For example, here we go again. We have a chlorine atom here and a chlorine atom here. And chlorine is actually diatomic, meaning it never exists as one in nature. It always exists as two in nature when it's not bonded to a different atom or element on the periodic table. So why does that happen? Well, if we take a look, here's chlorine. It's got seven valence electrons. This one does too. Both of these guys want to have eight. So what ends up happening, if we take a look, they end up sharing these two electrons right here. If they share these two electrons, then this will have two, four, six, eight valence electrons right here. And this chlorine atom will now have two, four, six, eight valence electrons as they share both of these. All right. So whenever we have two atoms that share electrons, one or more electrons, we have a covalent bond. So this is a covalent bond, but now we have to figure out whether or not it's polar or nonpolar covalent. And the way that we do that is by determining the electronegativity values of these two atoms here. For example, if we look at a periodic table like the one I showed you earlier, the electronegativity of chlorine is 3.0 and 3.0. And to get the electronegativity difference, this is a delta sign here, a little triangle, I simply take the absolute value of this first one, which is 3.0, minus the electronegativity of the second one, which is also 3.0, and this just happens to be 0. All right, so if the electronegativity difference is between about 0 and 0.4, and I'll show you a chart here in a couple seconds, then the bond that forms between here is going to be a nonpolar covalent bond. There's a nonpolar covalent bond that is is between these two atoms here, right? That's what's holding these two atoms together, right? A nonpolar covalent bond. And what does that mean exactly? Well, it means that these two electrons are being shared equally between this atom here and this atom here because the electronegativities of these two guys are identical, right? They're identical. They're very, the difference between them is super low. And remember that electronegativity is the ability an atom has to attract electrons toward itself. So they're not being drawn to this guy over here or this guy over here. They're being shared equally be because the electronegativities of these two are very similar to one another. All right, so that is an example of a nonpolar covalent bond. These guys are formed when electrons are shared equally uh, between two atoms in a compound or molecule. Okay, and typically these guys will be formed between a nonmetal and a nonmetal. So whenever you have a nonmetal and a nonmetal, it's going to be a covalent bond. But then you have to figure out whether or not it's nonpolar or polar by taking a look at the electronegativities. Let's take a look at an example of a polar covalent bond. All right, in a nonpolar covalent bond, we have uh, two atoms that are sharing electrons, one or more electrons, unequally. All right, so they're sharing because it's covalent. The electrons are being shared between the atoms, but because it's polar, uh, we have the sharing uh, between the atoms being unequal. All right, and once again, we have a nonmetal and a nonmetal whenever we have a polar covalent bond. So let's take a look at an example. If we take hydrogen and chlorine, for example, what ends up happening is that hydrogen wants two valence electrons. It's one of those that wants to satisfy a duet. Chlorine wants eight valence electrons. It only has seven right now. So what ends up happening is these guys come together and they share these two electrons right here. These two electrons get shared over here between these two atoms. And now this hydrogen here has got two valence electrons satisfying its duet. And this chlorine right here has got two, four, six, eight valence electrons. All right. So the octet rule has been satisfied for chlorine and the duet rule has been satisfied for the hydrogen. And because they're sharing electrons right here, 
The type of bond that forms is a covalent bond, and we can spot that because we have a nonmetal and a nonmetal. But if we want to figure out whether it's polar or nonpolar, what we have to do is we have to take a look at the electronegativities. And if we take a look at the electronegativity of hydrogen on a periodic table, it's 2.1, and chlorine is going to be 3.0. And if we take the uh, absolute value and subtract, should be an N right here, what I will end up with is 3.0 minus 2.1, and I end up with 0 0.9. Okay, so anytime you have an electronegativity difference that is between about 0.5 and approximately 1.6 or 1.7, then that is going to be a polar covalent bond. Yeah, that'll be polar covalent bond between these two atoms right here. And what does that mean? Well, the electrons that are being shared here are not being shared equally. They're spending most of their time surrounding the more electronegative element. That's this guy right here. And because electrons are negative and they're spending most of their time around this atom right here, this side becomes slightly more negative and this side becomes slightly more positive. All right. So in a polar covalent bond, we have electrons being shared unequally between atoms and the result is a positive side and a negative side of that molecule. So let's take a look at a few examples using the, uh, the electronegativity chart that I'm about to show you. All right, if we take a look at this electronegativity chart, this will help us determine what type of chemical bond exists between two different atoms. If the electronegativity difference between two atoms is 0 to 0 0.4, it's going to be nonpolar. Uh, 0 0.5 to 1.6, it will be polar, et cetera, et cetera. So let's apply this to a few example problems and go from there. All right, if we take a look here, you need to determine what type of chemical bonds exist between each of these elements or atoms right here. So what type of chemical bond exists right here between fluorine and fluorine? Well, if we take a look at our electronegativity chart, or if we take a look at the periodic table, uh, the electronegativity of this is 4.0, and this is 4.0. And if we subtract these two, we will get, and take the absolute value, we will get an uh, electronegativity difference of zero. So because we have an electronegativity of zero, this will be a nonpolar covalent bond. I'll put NPC here for nonpolar covalent. The electrons are being shared equally. If we take a look at water right here, what type of chemical bond exists between the hydrogen and oxygen here and the hydrogen and oxygen here? Well, if we take a look at our periodic table, the uh, electronegativity of this hydrogen is 2.1 and oxygen is going to be 3.5. If I subtract these and take the absolute value, I will end up with an electronegativity difference here of 1.4, right? 3.5 minus 2.1 is 1.4. And this looks like, if I take a look, that's in this range here. And so, yeah, these, this is going to be a polar covalent. I'll put PC for polar covalent bond that exists between here and here as well. If we take a look right here, we've got a metal and a nonmetal. So right away, that is going to tell you that this is ionic. And same, whoops, this should be ionic. And this should be ionic as well, since it's a metal and a nonmetal. Okay. So that one's pretty easy. If we take a look right here, carbon to oxygen, what type of chemical bond is this going to be? We have a nonmetal and a nonmetal, so we know it's going to be covalent. But if we take a look specifically, we can see that this is an electronegativity value of 3.5, and carbon is 2.5. And if I subtract these two and take the absolute value, I get an electronegativity difference of 1.0. If I look at my chart here, 1.0 is going to be polar covalent. So this is a polar covalent bond. We have a metal and a nonmetal right here. So this is going to be ionic. Whoops, ionic. And last but not least, if we take a look at the carbon to hydrogen bond here, carbon is going to be or have an electronegativity of 2.5. And hydrogen is 2.1, and if we subtract these two and take the absolute value, we will get an electronegativity difference of 0 0.4. And if we take a look, 0 0.4 is going to be nonpolar covalent. So I'll put NPC right here. 
So there you go. That's how you determine the types of chemical bonds using your periodic table and using this little chart here. And I hope you understand the difference between the three major types of intramolecular forces, ionic bonds, nonpolar covalent bonds, and polar covalent bonds. And I hope this was helpful.